Welcome. My name is Lillian Mills. I'm Dean of Texas McCombs. Thank you for joining our annual Business Outlook. This week, we focus on the future of real estate. I'd like to introduce our panelists. Their full biographies are on the event website. First, we have Layla Asani, who is a senior business economist at the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. As a member of the research department's regional group, Alani conducts research on regional economic issues, produces articles for their bank publications, and contributes to the Dallas Fed's website. John Goff is a private investor in Fort Worth, Texas, who invests in a variety of public and private industries through his family office, Goff Capital, which he founded in 2009. John co-founded Crescent Real Estate with Richard Rainwater in the early 1990s. We're proud that he has his BBA from McCombs, serves on my Dean's Advisory Council, and was inducted into the McCombs Hall of Fame in 2014. Professor Greg Hallman is a distinguished uh, senior lecturer in finance and real estate finance at the McCombs School of Business and he directs our Texas Real Estate Center and is faculty director of the McCombs Real Estate Investment Fund, a student-run investment fund that invests both in REITs and private equity real estate. So we'll now turn to the discussion and we're gonna start with some framing around the pandemic and move into the future and the pandemic's been disruptive to other industries, of course, but both to residential and commercial real estate. And all of us have experienced more working from home, shopping from home, eating from home. That affects the real estate market. And so these three excellent speakers are going to talk to us about markets, the pandemic, inflation, sky-high house prices, and what the future brings. So Greg, we're going to start in the look back. Why don't you give us some perspective of the last two years, which sectors have done well, and which have suffered here recently? Oh, thank you, Lil. Yes, uh, for, a, for an event that was supposed to be uh, a real catastrophe for real estate, I, I, can, I can happily report that this has not really been the case. We have had some sectors that have done well and some sectors that have suffered. So let me just give you some numbers. These are out of the public markets, the real estate investment trust markets, some sector returns, and these are returns pandemic to date. So from the start of the pandemic uh, through the end of November of 2021, so through the end of last year, uh, the best performing real estate sector over the time of the pandemic has been the self-storage sector. Mm. And I think a lot of this is driven by the fact that Many of us were asked to set up home offices and we needed a place to put all that stuff we had in our home office. And so that was self-storage. I think another thing that has attracted investors to that space and driven valuations in that space is that self-storage could be a particularly good sector to be in in times of inflation. A lot of those self-storage contracts are month to month mm -hmm. and the self-storage operators are very good at moving prices up. And it's almost like, a floating rate bond with one month resets, which is exactly mm -hmm. where you'd want to be in inflation. The second uh, biggest move or so, so self storage is up 70% over that time period. Industrial assets, which are warehouses that make up the backbone of the supply chain in this country, and they're up 57%. And I think it's interesting. We've heard a lot about this pandemic economy where, uh, where people have changed their spending from services to stuff, for lack of a better word. And so the best two performing real estate sectors have been places to put that stuff, and which is self-storage. We've also seen really big moves in data center REITs, which are the place that houses the internet that all of us have been living on for the last two years. Those assets are up 44%. Timber REITs, which supply some of the boards that we used in all of this uh, with sky high house prices and a lot more building we've seen, those have done very well. And residential REITs, especially single family rental REITs have done very well. Another good place to be if you expect inflation, which is in an asset class that can reset prices as inflation comes. Real quick on some that have not done as well, 
Healthcare assets have not done as well, but they're only down 6% over the time of the pandemic. It seems a little counterintuitive that healthcare assets would go down in value during an event that's that certainly drove a lot of demand for healthcare, but hospitals have suffered because their elective surgeries are down. Right. And uh, we've also seen small declines in office and hotel, as you might expect. But overall, the real estate market has really fared pretty well during the pandemic. It's just that we've seen a lot of sector results driven by how this pandemic has changed how we work and how we live. Well, Greg, you finished up with hotel and office, and I'm going to use that to pivot over to John Goff, because John, that's those are sectors that you have been involved in quite a bit over your career. And I know you've got a really big project in downtown Fort Worth that's going to be office, hotel, and apartments. And so uh, let's start with office and then move to hotel. What's your thinking on the near-term future of office buildings as we come out of the pandemic and our work from home, uh, what that looks like in the future? Oh. oh I think you're muted, John. Sorry about go. that. Um, that's why I'm not good at Zoom. Um, <laughs> you know, fortunately, we saw our strategy pay off uh, in a defensive way in an environment that we would have never dreamed of. Never did we underwrite a pandemic uh, on anything we've ever bought. Mm -hmm. uh, but high quality buildings and markets that have been the first to come back, typically the Sun Belt, with high quality tenants that individually were able to withstand the pandemic, you know, this all fared well. It's important to note that office leases are nothing more than unsecured credit obligations of the tenant. So this downturn really accentuated the need for high quality underwriting of those credits uh, because we couldn't have ever predicted that this would happen. We experienced virtually no financial loss from tenants uh, through the pandemic. Physical occupancy varies greatly and the recovery has varied uh, greatly depending on geography. And not to make this a political discussion, but it, there is a 100% correlation. Uh, red cities came back much quicker than blue cities mm -hmm. where local policies were less restrictive in the red, in the red markets. Uh, my thoughts on the future quickly are people need to physically interact, company cultures uh, and I've had I've built a, com a couple of companies are really difficult to, to build remotely or through Zoom. There's no doubt that productivity of office work suffered during the pandemic. I think we figured out how to make things function, but I don't think things were maximized. Uh, competition demands physical interaction. Uh, just quick example: late last year, we had two competitions in our office one for an investment banking assignment, and one for the selection of an architect for a very important project. You can guess who won each of those. It's the companies that physically came to meet with us face-to-face. -face. Uh, that definitely influenced us uh, from a competitive standpoint. Clearly, many companies are rethinking their space needs and the design of space. Uh, there's gonna be less density in the future. Space per employee is gonna be impacted open floor plans that we've become accustomed to are going to evolve. Uh, we're gonna want more outdoor space that can be easily accessed. Um, I think offices are gonna become more flexible to allow for some work from home mm -hmm. and tenants are gonna be very demanding on air quality and building amenities. Uh, finally, we're just gonna be a lot more selective on sites that we uh, select. Uh, there's got to be nearby amenities. There's got to be design quality. Uh, a lot of the isolated suburban buildings that were built in the 80s with no adjacent amenities are ultimately going to be mothballed, in my opinion. Mm. Uh, and I have to say that uh, red versus blue will definitely influence our investment decisions going forward. John, thank you. I'm going to pivot over to Layla, and then we're going to come back to you to talk about the cycle in real estate markets. Okay. Um, so Layla, we often hear from our real estate alums and, and others that real estate does well when the economy does well. 
It's been a pretty scary two years for the economy, but as a Fed economist, what what do you want to offer about the what's driving our great economic performance nationally and in Texas? And what what would you like to offer about how the economy looks going forward? Well, first of all, good afternoon, everyone. And um, thank you so much for the invitation to be a part of this panel. Um, you're absolutely right, Lil, that the Texas and US economy uh, indeed have seen extremely robust growth in the last year. In fact, both GDP as well as employment growth has exceeded all expectations, both for Texas as well as for the US. Uh, but the economic downturn, I think, and the recovery has been unusual in many respects. Um, back in, in spring of 2020, I think pretty, things were pretty scary and we expected a major collapse in the US economy, uh, as well as in the labor market. We expected you know, financial markets to be unstable, but none, a, whole, a lot of that was averted. Uh, in fact, what we saw as a result was we saw rising income, surging demand for goods and housing, um, and labor shortages, uh, which is not typically what we see in a downturn and the ensuing recovery, especially in the initial stages of the recovery. Now, typically during a recession, what happens is we see a decline in personal incomes and that occurs because uh, there have been mass layoffs in the economy. Typically there's a stock market correction that happens. And so people feel their wealth uh, depreciate. And as that happens, they spend less on the economy and that leads to a further and further contraction. But uh, because of the, the both the monetary as well as the fiscal stimulus that was pumped into the economy, we were able to stave off a long and deep recession in the US economy. But what that did was it led to a rise in personal income. So like I said, typically during a recession, personal incomes decline. Uh, for example, in the 2008 financial crisis, we saw personal income drop off by about 4.5% from the first quarter of 2008 through the second quarter of 2009, which was the, the length of the recession. This time around between the first quarter and second quarter of 2020, uh, personal incomes rose um, almost 6%, and they continued rising into 2021. And again, the increase in personal, these, uh, in personal income was due to the government transfer payments, which came in the form of stimulus checks, right. the expanded unemployment benefits, you know, the PPP loans that were given to businesses, uh, and then most recently, the child tax credit payments. And all of that together uh, gave enough money into consumers' hands, and they were able to spend. And as we know, a large percent of our GDP growth comes from consumer spending. They got economic recovery, indeed. Um, has been quite steep um, and um, very robust. On, on top of that, the labor market has tightened significantly in the last year, as we all hear about the labor mm -hmm. shortages, there is hardly any slack in the labor market. Uh, and that uh, means wages are rising and consumers again are feeling um, more wealthier than usual. To add to that, home prices have gone up and that has also added to the wealth effect. So looking ahead, we expect that US growth should be solid in 2022 though slower than the rapid 5.5% um, GDP growth that the US economy experienced last year, but still faster than any um, year since 2003. On the Texas front, the, the, the big number that we typically look at is employment growth. Mm -hmm. And again, our expectation is that job growth for Texas this year will be about 3%, which is above its historical average of uh, 2%. Um, growth we feel will be driven by COVID fading further this year, continued reopening of the service sector, uh, and then a continued growth in the labor market. Also on the consumer side, as I mentioned earlier, they have healthier balance sheets because of strong wage growth and the savings that they have been able to build up because of the various uh, forms of payment. Uh, and uh, we aren't seeing any slowing in consumer spending yet. I think the main drag on growth or our sort of our headwinds going forward are the continued labor shortages. Um, as well as the supply bottlenecks, which are expected to linger at least through the first half of, of, of this year. So that might dampen demand going forward. Also, perhaps the dissipating of the federal stimulus will also have some moderation effect on overall uh, spending in the economy. Leila, thanks so much. I, I had told John we're going to come back to the real estate cycle question. And I've noticed in the participant questions submitted, someone asked specifically about Austin, John, so it must be an Austin viewer. Um, and I know you're up in Fort Worth, but you have investments down here as well. So if you can talk a little bit about 
where you think we are either nationally or in Texas or for this viewer in Austin in terms of the real estate cycle. And do you think we're in a unique place coming out of the pandemic and its effect on the cycle? Or do you think you just have comments about the real estate cycle generally? So back over to you, where are we in the cycle? Well, the state of Texas has just been a huge beneficiary of in-migration. Yes. Uh, and that's one of the things that we follow very closely uh, as a company. Uh, we look at demographic movement throughout the US. And let me, um, let me just say that overriding everything we do is looking at population growth. So population growth in the U.S. historically prior to uh, up until, say, the 70s uh, ran at about, uh, you know, somewhere around 2% a year, all the way actually into 2010. Uh, the last decade, it averaged about 0.6%. So it's dropped off. So we're keeping a very close eye on that. But what's happening is that if you look at between, even in spite of that decline between 2021 and 2025, we're probably going to add somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 million people into the US. So the question is, where are those 10 million people going to reside? Texas will get a disproportionate share of that. Austin will be a big beneficiary as well as I think every one of our major metropolitan areas. Um, Austin is going to be somewhat handicapped with its lack of investment in infrastructure. Um, that's definitely going to be an impediment as we go forward, but it's still going to be a very popular place to locate. And I have to say the fact that the University of Texas uh, is located there, you know, has a big, big uh, influence on companies deciding to uh, relocate to that market. So I think that's going to continue, but I think all of Texas is going to benefit from this in migration as well as uh, this growth in, you know, our population. I just want to quickly jump in and kind of um, tag along what um, John mentioned. So we've been also following the migration trends quite closely. And what we noticed that during the pandemic, in fact, when we expected in migration to Texas slow down because people weren't moving and there were lockdowns in place, um, the, the net number of people who moved to Texas uh, in, in 2020 was higher than what we had seen as on average between 2017 and 2019. So in fact, more people made Texas their home. Uh, during the pandemic and a bulk, the majority of those people either came into Dallas, uh, Fort Worth, uh, in terms of numbers, DFW mm -hmm. was the, 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 saw the largest increase uh, in, in net numbers and followed by Austin. But we, because Austin is a much smaller city relative to DFW, the in-migration rates were spectacular for Austin. So truly a lot of people have made Texas their home uh, in, in the last year. And that has been a reason why uh, this, our, our, both our housing market, our apartment markets, markets have done so well in the past year and a half. Well, let's talk about inflation. That's a topic of hot concern in 2022. And uh, Leila, I'm going to start with you about some key challenges in the construction industry or the supply chain for construction that might be fueling some of the surge in prices generally and in real estate. And so how is that environment affecting both of those sectors? And what do you see in the, in the near term in 2022? So um, yeah, the construction sector is currently mired with supply side challenges. I mean, though demand remains strong for most property types and we're seeing home sales um, being really solid. Builders and developers are grappling with ongoing supply chain issues and labor shortages. And these are elongating their completion times as well as putting upward pressure on project costs. So in fact, if you look at the producer price index for construction materials, it was up 22% uh, uh -huh. in 2001, which is a huge use increase and which means higher costs are translating into higher final prices uh, for these property types, particularly for homes. Uh, many home builders tell us that they are metering sales and they're holding off putting homes on the market until they have a better visibility of the cost because we know in the construction sector, costs have been extremely volatile. Not only have costs moved up and down quite a bit in the last uh, year, also the availability is, is a little bit dodgy. And so 
because they don't have a sense of when they will get materials, what their costs are, are looking like. Uh, they are holding back on, uh, on selling homes up front. They're doing sort of more spec, uh, spec construction and spec sales. Now, all of this is further tightening supply, it's further pushing up prices, but if you kind of take a step back and generally look at the US economy as a whole, we've seen inflation become broad based. Uh, initially, there were spikes in a few categories in the right. spring and summer of, of last year, but since then inflation has become broad based. Uh, this is typically captured by the CPI or the consumer price index, which is a measure of inflation, and right. that is at its highest level since 1982. Um, another measure of inflation that we closely watch is the PCE, which is the Personal Consumption Expenditures Index, and that also was up quite markedly, 5.5% uh, uh, last year. So prices of nearly all items are up, and this is reflected in each of our grocery bills, our gas bills, our utility bills, and any, anything other that we are purchasing uh, currently. So the expectation is that while inflation will likely slow from its elevated rate, um, because you know the spike in car prices uh, is unlikely, hopefully, to get repeated again this year, um, and supply chain should eventually improve um, somewhat in the second half of this year. We expect that inflation will likely uh, fall back down, but not down to where it was pre-pandemic. Pre-pandemic, it was kind of averaging near two percent. The expectation is that even with the moderation, it will be well above that level uh, for this year. Again, one thing to keep in mind is that the elevated home prices that we saw last year, as well as the, you know, the big escalation in rents in the second half of last year, those are slowly being reflected now in the inflation data. And so they will stay in the data um, for the next uh, you know, few, few months. Um, also, so far, firms are not finding much resistance in terms of uh, from consumers in being able to pass on these elevated costs. So that will also have an impact on CPI. Mm -hmm. uh, overall, um, I mean, the Fed is sort of committed to achieving price stability, uh, and they, they plan to sort of bring inflation back closer to their 2% target. But, you know, but inflation and, and the overall economy takes a while to respond to both monetary uh, policy. So although that action probably will occur sometimes, it will, uh, the impact will mm -hmm. be long and will have some lags. Well, I'm going to pivot from that for a question that I want both Greg and John to answer, and I'll give Greg the first bite at it. And it's really a more historical view. Does real estate perform well in times of inflation? And as a result, how do you view real estate as an investment now if inflation continues to be higher than the last decade? So Greg, sure. what do you think? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Lil. You know, if we look back over past periods of inflation, real estate has actually done pretty well in inflationary time periods. And, and I think because the main driver of real estate returns is the health of the overall economy. And, and we have, except for the stagflation of the early 70s, we have generally seen inflation go along with economic growth. And, and that has has done okay for real estate. They're, I've been looking with my classes at some of the uh, historical data of REIT returns during inflationary periods, and we actually find better returns than, than really people expect to have. Uh, I like real estate a lot in, in inflationary periods. Uh, I, I sometimes dis describe uh, real estate as, as bonds made out of bricks, and, and they provide regular cash flows. But the nice thing about those cash flows is the owners have an have an, an ability to reset those rents as inflation goes up, and so you know when people are asking me about where can I invest in real estate to get some relief from inflation, I tell them to look at the lease length. And so you know, longer term leases. If you're stuck in a lease length as an owner for ten years and you don't have a good way to raise those prices, like office buildings, healthcare assets, those assets suffer more in inflationary times. But the shorter lease terms that we see, like I said, in self-storage, single-family rentals, multifamily assets, those can really perform quite well in inflationary times because an inflation hedge depends on the ability to move your cash flows along with inflation. John, how about you? Well, don't have a lot to add. I, I agree with what Greg said, but you know, just personally, real estate is a wonderful store of wealth, in my opinion in an inflationary environment. And as Greg pointed out, the, the data proves that out. 
you know, different property types clearly reprice at different rates. So office is the slowest to reprice and benefit from an inflationary environment. Hotels and apartments are much faster. Hotels are daily. Um, so you love owning hotels in, a, in an inflationary environment. Uh, we have a lot of exposure to that marketplace. Uh, you don't like them as much when it's deflationary and you hate them when there's a pandemic. So, uh, but it's, uh, in, inflation is the friend of real estate. You know, we just need to be careful as investors uh, that when you're going into an inflationary period that you capitalize prudently, uh, you don't want to over leverage with floating rate debt, obviously, okay. and you want to be very careful with mezzanine financing. That's John, true. thanks, because there was a question about how rising interest rates affect financing, and it was in the Q&A, and you already answered it, so thank you. Um, I'm going to ask the panelists to keep their answers a little short so we can get to a few more submitted questions, um, but I've got a few more things around home prices. Uh, Layla, how did the boom in the housing market affect consumer pocketbooks? Um, and how's that tied to the general economy? So uh, typically, I mean, housing is a big part of what consumers spend um, their, income on, their income on. So as home prices rise and also as apartment rents rise, that takes a bigger chunk out of people's uh, budgets. Uh, typically, that's what the impact is. So if you have less, if you are spending more on housing, that means you have less to spend on other goods. But the reason why the economy has been able to support all the spending that we are seeing currently, um, as, as Greg had alluded to earlier, we have good spending is about 12% above where it was pre-pandemic. Uh, the, the reason for that has been the increase in, in, in personal income, uh, which has supported uh, th that. Uh, in terms of um, overall, how does housing sort of um, help the economy? I think there's a wealth effect involved in it for most consumers. Housing is sort of their big asset that they have in their portfolios. Uh, people less so have owned stocks and bonds. And when that, when that asset goes up in prices, people feel wealthier, which means when they feel wealthier, they tend to spend uh, a little bit more. And so I think that has truly supported the consumer spending that we have seen currently in the economy. Also with home prices going up and demand for industrial space going up and demand for um, you know, apartments going up, we've seen more construction. There was a pause in construction back in spring of 2022 that got reversed in the second half and we've seen con construction come back strongly for those property types. And again, that does add to GDP. Typically three to 5% mm -hmm. of GDP comes from spending on construction. And so we've seen a boost from that as well. John, I wanna have you help us with new technology, particularly in the commercial space. So, We've got, well, Zoom, among other uh, remote meeting technologies and working from home. We have more autonomous vehicles and more shared vehicle uh, usage, and we're paying more attention to energy conservation. Which of all these new technologies and trends are affecting what you're doing in commercial office space and what you think the next couple of decades will bring? Well, they look, they all affect us. Uh, uh -huh. Remote work, we have to embrace at some level. It's going to compete with office space. So we've got to be really picky about what office we develop and what the amenities are, uh, open spaces, access to outdoor spaces. Um, the most successful office properties going forward are going to be those that are viewed as safe, um, newer with the latest HVAC and the latest amenities. Um, look, autonomous vehicles are going to have a huge impact. And we're thinking about this every time we build a new project. We're also thinking about it from the standpoint of uh, parking garages that right. might make for good investments that ultimately are gonna be torn down. Um, the nemesis of all developers are these darn parking garages that we have to build to accommodate the appetite, particularly here in Texas, for a lot of parking density. And it's, uh, it's a pain. They're expensive. Uh, they're comp they make a development very complicated in terms of how you incorporate them. 
Um, so that actually is going to be a huge opportunity when we become less dependent on vehicles, you know, one per every office worker or one per every two or three office workers. Um, and I think that's going to be a big opportunity going forward, redeveloping off uh, parking garages. Uh, sustainability and green building technologies is very important. Uh, it's rapidly impacting uh, what we do. We're even going to, in some of our new projects, uh, green concrete uh, that uses less natural resources, emits less carbon dioxide. Uh, mechanical, electrical, HVAC, as I mentioned, all are impacted greatly. Customers want to see, we refer to tenants as customers. Customers want to see the very latest in that technology. Yeah, just to add on to that about mm -hmm. the sustainability, John, I, I think, you know, we sometimes look at, at, at higher vacancy rates in some cities of office and we wonder why people are still building offices. But I think the sustainability aspect is really, we, we built so much office space in the 80s, but it's really hard to make that office space behave like we want it to behave today. Right. And so I, I think really, while we might have a lot of office out there, I, I kind of believe the sustainability has made a lot of that product just obsolete. And, and there's no doubt. And yeah. the price difference is yeah. rental rate differences are greater than they've ever been. And it all relates to quality. Yeah, yeah. And so I think there's an opportunity for development in that space that's driven a lot by the obsolescence of the old space in terms of sustainability. And like John said, a lot of those parking lots and parking garages are sitting on really nice real estate right in the middle of some really busy cities. And, and our cities are going to be more lively when those things yeah. get turned into places for people to work or live. Yeah. No doubt. Well, one of the questions that popped up in it live was... Uh, Back, John, to your comment in suburbia that we have these 1980s buildings, and you and Greg were just talking about that. What, what do you think those are going to be repurposed for? Do they just get occupied with much lower rents, or do they get torn down if you want to answer? So... Like some are, some are becoming data centers, uh, okay. becoming uh, warehouse space. Um, some are able to be repurposed, but as Greg said, it's typically uh, cost prohibitive to turn a suburban 80s building into something that competes with a currently developed building. Right. Um, and then the other, the other big factor is a lot of those suburban buildings have really nothing around them. There's no amenities and tenants want amenities. They've got to have them walkable and right there, you know, accessible for all their employees. And that's really problematic. And in my opinion, you know, a lot of the Texas markets, um, the data on occupancy shows, I think, an overrated level of vacancy. I think there's a whole swath of buildings we need to take out of the denominator. Mm. Yeah, it's not. And I do think that, you know, we've had some work from home and remote work questions come up also. Some of those suburban offices might end up as kind of uh, like we work spaces, temporary spaces for, mm -hmm. for firms that might have a nice office downtown, but they might grab some temporary space or rent out a little space in the suburbs for some of the remote workers. But, but I am worried about a lot of them. We just saw a 1980s building in Houston uh, get pretty much taken over by lenders at about a fifth of the amount of the debt. And so there is some, there's some dead, there's some dead wood out there to clear out. That's for sure. Yep. Well, one of the pre-submitted questions that just popped up in our live questions has to do with bubbles or corrections. And uh, is there a bubble going on in single family homes in DFW and Austin? Do you see any market correction in the near term um, and uh, how might an increase in interest rates affect these valuations? So I'm gonna throw that one up, who wants it? Layla, you wanna try that first? You... I'll, I'll take a stab at it first. So yeah. I think in, in terms of market fundamentals, if you look at the housing market, uh, we feel that market fundamentals have supported higher prices. And that's because we know that supply is very, very low relative to demand. If you look at the existing home market, the home, the supply number is one and a half months typically. 
uh, six months is considered a balanced market, which I think with the internet, uh, nowadays with the internet playing a bigger role in the home search process, it's probably more down to around four, four and a half months of supply considered uh, a balanced market. But still, even if you look at the four and a half months, one and a half months is, is, is well below that. The, um, also, we know builders are mired with a lot of oper operational challenges. So what, I, what we resoundingly hear from our builders is I can sell the home, I just can't build it and finish it. Um, mm. And that continues to be the case. I don't think we, uh, the expectation is that any of that will resolve uh, anytime soon in the near future, which means supply will remain low and demand will con continue to outperform supply. And therefore, the fundamentals are still well in place for uh, not to see a correction in the housing market per se. But though, with that being said, I think Last year was an exceptional year in terms of seeing almost 18 to 20% home price appreciation. Likely that will not play out this year. The expectations are ranging from anywhere between three to six or 7% in terms of home price appreciation, much more normal, like a normal market would behave in housing, but not a frothy market that we saw uh, in 2021. In terms of rising rates, I think mortgage rates obviously have been have played a, a big role in propping up the housing market. Rates were at record lows, which means uh, people were right. able to afford the higher priced homes given how low mortgage rates were. They were, they were able to afford it. With the cost of um, capital rising, people, the same house, Citrus Paribus, will cost a lot more in terms of that mortgage payments, will, which will also damp, dampen demand uh, this year. So. Uh, I think it's it's going to, I'm not saying there's a correction coming in the housing market, but definitely we'll, we'll see a moderation and a more return to normal. Yeah, I would add on to that. I, I completely agree with the lack of supply, uh, especially in the cities that people want to move to. The home building industry just came apart at the seams after the 2008-2009 crisis. And there are estimates out there that we have underbuilt by close to 6 million houses. And I think we see that in the popular cities. We see this very low supply of, of, of houses on the market for the demand that's in there. And I, I think it's that plus people are choosing different cities to live in. And as that demand moves around, it's certainly gonna push those house prices up. But I, I do worry when I see 20%. I mean, I, I, I've been teaching mortgage-backed securities here for 20 years. But I don't worry as much because I think the banks are in a lot better shape than they were in 07. I worry about housing crashes that crash the banks. And I don't see, I don't see subprime products, non-agency product, anything like that, that's going to end up eating the banks up if we do have a housing price correction. But I, I more agree with Layla. I think we're going to see a moderation of growth more than we're going to see a collapse in price. Well, I think I'm going to give John the last question that was pre-submitted about where, what property types and sectors do you think are good investments in Texas for 2022? Well, um, I like all major food groups in Texas right now. Uh, I just think Texas is going to be a big beneficiary again of this uh, continued inward migration as well as population growth. You know, if you go back to that number I said of 10 million people added over the next five years, that's the equivalent of every major market in the state of Texas, Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, San Antonio, plus add in Chicago. So you think about all that real estate that's going to be built. I'm not saying it's all going to be built in Texas, but Texas, again, will get its disproportionate share of that. That's a lot of development and redevelopment that's got to occur in that time period. But I like uh, office. I think you have to be very careful about location, uh, the quality, again, amenities. Uh, I would look for redevelopment opportunities throughout the state. I think there are a lot of older buildings that might possibly be repurposed. We've done some of that uh, successfully. And that's uh, the returns on repurposing buildings can be quite good. Um, I would be careful in really dense downtowns. I worry about some of the really tall, uh, older buildings, you know, whether those are going to ever see full occupancy again. Um, apartments and single family housing, uh, I just think it's a very interesting market. It's going to continue to be for reasons just uh, dis discussed. Um, I do think there is a growing um, opportunity with prefabricated projects, um, manufactured housing. 
Industrial is going to be off the charts good. Uh, we've got a lot of really good industrial developers in the state. Hotel at the higher end, I really like. I'm less focused on uh, the lower class properties. You know, if you think about the state of Texas, we really don't have an ultra high end resort property. I can't think of one. And um, I am hopefully uh, going to be developing one. But I think there's a real opportunity in high end hotels. Retail redevelopment, I think, is interesting. Uh, I think there's a lot of retail projects that need to be reimagined. And I think there's some good returns to be had in that, uh, in spite of what's happening with the internet. And the last thing I would say is land. I love land. Um, I, I think taking big land positions right now can will prove to be very smart. Well, hey, Lil, can I add just one thing before the best sector to uh, the best, another good sector to be selling in real estate right now is smart real estate students. And we have a lot of them and we have a very high demand. We have employers lining up at the door. We yep. have good undergrads and good graduate students. And so now I'll let you close, but I had to put that well, in. Well, I was going to make <laughs> that same plug. UT Austin is one of the unique universities where we can combine architect, structural engineering, urban planning, sustainability, computer science, business and real estate finance. And so it's a well-rounded approach to thinking about real estate here at UT Austin. And I am just so delighted that Layla and John and Greg joined me today to offer their insights. Our co-sponsors are on the screen again. We will uh, upload our recording so that all registrants can view it and forward it to their friends. Thank you for tuning in today and welcome horns. Oh, thanks, Lil. Come on, Thank you.